All right. Well, welcome everybody. I appreciate your taking the time out of out of your day today to uh, join us for this meeting. Uh, today's presentation is a uh, rise of the machine learning, and it's going to take a look at Azure machine learning uh, for business intelligence in apps and as a product in Azure Marketplace. Uh, after the presentation, if anybody wanted to reach out and network, or if you have any questions or want to share ideas, I would welcome that opportunity at either my Twitter account or on LinkedIn. Uh, this presentation is for the past business analytics virtual chapter. I want to thank them also for this opportunity, and I'll do my best today to make sure that I provide a valuable presentation for everyone. Uh, so starting out, uh, what do I hope you get out of this session? So first of all, an understanding of how predictive analytics, specifically regarding Azure ML, uh, can be integrated into your own analytic initiatives. So how can this new technology work with your BI, work with your reporting, uh, work with the other things that you're doing in your organization in order to provide value and to uh, uh, effectively help you solve business problems? Also to talk about what is Azure ML and how is it different from traditional tools? So this is a, a new cloud-based solution that's a little bit different from some of the predictive analytics you may have been exposed to in the past. Uh, we'll take a look at some use cases and I'll go through a couple demos to show you how you can use uh, data specifically in a BI and also a IoT, uh, Internet of Things type uh, scenario to uh, add some value and, uh, and help out your, your organization. And also, how do you get started? So by the end of this, I hope you'll see that uh, this is a product that you can get going with pretty quickly. You can even do it on your own if your organization doesn't have an account. And uh, there's a lot of ways where you can learn without having to go through an extensive uh, educational process before you get going. And then I'll try to make sure that we also reserve enough time for Q&A. Uh, so first of all, just a little bit of background about myself. I've been working on the Microsoft BI stack since 2007. Uh, right now I am GNET Group's North American Data Science Practice Lead, and I'd like to say that I'm fortunate to have been working with Azure ML since it was still in preview mode back in 2014. So I've had some time to see this product uh, become part of general availability and also to see it mature and have some new things added to it. A uh, little bit of background, I went to a couple local universities here in Minnesota. Uh, most importantly, uh, I think all of us in the analytic world uh, do a lot of self-directed learning, and that's something that uh, with the pace that these types of technologies evolve is going to be uh, very important um, as we move forward. So I'll start off quickly with just a general definition of machine learning, and I just pulled this right off Wikipedia because it can be an intimidating term for some people, but it shouldn't be. Uh, it's a scientific discipline that explores the construction and study of algorithms that can learn from data. So that's where it's a little bit different from traditional analytics. It's not just summing things up, averaging them, getting your standard deviations. It's actually bringing new data into an application in order to give you new predictions. Um, you basically build a model using your historical data and then you're able to store the patterns that are in your historical data and apply them to new data as it comes in. Uh, there's also a lot of confusing terminology that uh, is out there, and some of it's hype, and some of it's just uh, different ways of um, looking at things. But this is just kind of my view that I put together on how I like to separate some of the different terms that you'll see associated with these technologies. So within the discipline of statistics, you have data science, which is using statistical methodologies on data. And within data science, you then have predictive analytics, which is effectively trying to predict the future based upon uh, data from the past. And then within predictive analytics, uh, because you can do some predictive analytics in uh, traditional tools, uh, such as um, even with SQL statements, you can take uh, past trends and project them into the future. But within predictive analytics, machine learning can be seen as a unique discipline and a unique And then within machine learning, you'll also have data mining. And the reason I put that in there is some of you may have worked with uh, the traditional data mining tools and analysis services, and those are effectively a subset of machine learning. So if you've worked with those algorithms in the past in uh, the traditional uh, cube-type format, um, 
that's something which is, is basically now available in Azure ML along with some additional capabilities that weren't in the traditional uh, data mining tools. Uh, another kind of buzzword you'll hear out there is uh, artificial intelligence. I don't really like this term, uh, but looking around, it was basically defined as the study and, des and design of art intelligent agents and the creation of machines that think. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. What we're basically just doing here is storing patterns and then using them to uh, make predictions. But that is something that you'll often hear associated with these technologies. And then also big data, uh, which is another hype word. And uh, using machine learning with big data can provide tremendous value, but machine learning is not part of big data. And sometimes you'll see people confuse that, that the two are kind of synonymous and one and the same. And I just thought it would be helpful to clarify that uh, big data is its own unique thing. It's uh, massive volumes of structured and unstructured data um, and, and a, a different type of technology to be able to uh, organize that data. Um, but it's not uh, machine learning. And this slide I just put in here to kind of start you off with an idea of what machine learning is going to be able to do for you. Uh, so the philosopher uh, from the Middle Ages, uh, Immanuel Kant, um, or actually I think it was technically medieval times, but same difference, um, his insight into reality is applied to machine learning. Uh, basically what he said is that if your brain, you can only perceive the world in the way that the water fills the cup. So that you can only understand what you experience through your eyes, your ears, your taste, your smell, uh, the sensors effectively that you have to experience the world. And machine learning in many ways is the same way. You're building these algorithms that are fed data, which you can think of as your eyes, your ears, your touch, your taste, your smell, and then it's basically making predictions based upon how the algorithm has been designed to perceive that data. So that's, uh, I think, a helpful way to, to kind of see the difference here between uh, machine learning and predictive analytics and traditional uh, analytics. A couple of success stories. This is not a new technology. Uh, Azure ML is new, but machine learning has been around for decades. Uh, speech recognition technology, so Siri and Cortana, uh, those are machine learning uh, type applications. Spam filters. Uh, Microsoft had machine learning algorithms working with Hotmail uh, 10, 15 years ago in order to filter out spam. Recommendation engines, so when a retail website tells you that people who like this also bought this, people who bought this also bought this, that's a market basket machine learning type algorithm. Handwriting recognition that the post office uses to read the, uh, the addresses and return addresses on your, on your letters is uh, machine learning. News story clustering is another example. Credit fraud detection. So when your credit card company calls you and says, did you make this purchase on this day, at this time, at this place, that's because a, uh, a machine learning algorithm that's looking for uh, basically outliers of your expected behavior flagged it as something that, uh, that is not typical to, to how you make your purchases. Also, self-driving cars are using a lot of machine learning algorithms, which allows them to get better and better over time as they accumulate more data. And also robotics. So robotics uh, is using machine learning in order to uh, create algorithms that allow the robots to adapt to their environments. Uh, image recognition, which I'll show a, a quick, fun uh, demo of here. Also facial recognition uses a lot of machine learning. So I'll switch over here. And it's not a Microsoft tool, but it's just a, just a fun demo on what machine learning can do here. So in Google Images, if you upload an image to that service, and I haven't pre-indexed anything or anything like that. Um, so I basically came home one day, and my wife had uh, adopted a five-year-old golden doodle, and it's a great dog. Um, and I thought I'd use a picture of him as an example. So here's a picture I'm going to upload from when we first got him. And if I upload that to Google Images, a machine learning algorithm will take a look at that image and it'll provide images of similar uh, photos. And you can see most of them are poodle mixes, which a golden doodle is. Uh, some of them look like they might actually be golden doodles. And so it was actually not only able to identify that it's a dog, but it was also in many cases able to identify that it was also a poodle mix, which uh, I, I think is pretty impressive. If we were to upload another image, 
So after having him for a while, we decided to give him more of a schnauzer haircut, uh, so he looks a little bit more tough. And uh, basically, if I upload that image, so it's not the standard haircut for a golden doodle, you'll then see that it still recognized it as a dog, but because the haircut was different, it didn't really know uh, what type of dog or breed of dog it was. So, so that's kind of what you're trying to accomplish with your data with machine learning. There's, I'll, I'll move back to the slide set here. So the, the point here is that there's a lot of fun things that are going on with machine learning and there's a lot of cool stuff going on with research, like this image recognition. It's fun, it's cool, it's useful, but how do we apply it to analytics and business in order to provide value? Because image recognition, unless you're working maybe in a manufacturing setting, is going to have a very limited scope of uh, what you can use it for in order to provide value. So, so how can you out there as a, a data professional start making some uh, valuable uses, make some, uh, make some value out of uh, machine learning? So what I'll show here is the decision-making process today, and this will show you where machine learning is going to fit into uh, the traditional decision-making process. So traditionally, when there's a business issue, professionals will look at their data to understand that issue, and they'll ask, uh, what do I know? And if it's something they've seen before and that they know about and that they understand, they have some intuition about it and they can make a decision. If it's something they have not seen before and they don't understand and they need to know more, they'll either ask other people in the organization to uh, see if anybody else knows about it, go to the analysts and say, spin me up a pivot table in Excel and try to find out what's at the bottom of this, uh, or go to IT and ask for more reports. And I'm sure a lot of you have been in that situation where you keep providing more detailed and uh, more extensive reports that never quite seem to solve the problem that you're trying to answer. And that becomes part of the decision, which then becomes part of the lessons learned and uh, feeds back into the entire process cycle. Now with machine learning, uh, the idea is that you take the intuition that's being used to make decisions and you effectively build that into the machine learning model. So you use machine learning in order to, first of all, validate the intuition, then build a model around the different factors that are being used to make those decisions, which I'll show in the different demos, and then that becomes part of the decision. So the idea is to take the, uh, I'd, I'd almost call them KPIs that leadership are looking for when they have a problem, is what's going on here, what caused it, is it on the east coast or the west coast, what time of year is it, which product line is it, and then you build those into a, an algorithm so that you can scale up that type of decision making process. And as I'll show in the demo, you can also use tools as simple as uh, Excel and, uh, and basically validate that your model is working so you're not just getting a mystery prediction, you can actually do cycles in which you test the accuracy of the predictions. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen something similar in other business intelligence presentations, but we're really looking to find that needle in the haystack. So it's easy to look at one chart and see what's going on, uh, but when you start having uh, multiple th thousands of customers in your customer dimension, tens of thousands of products in your product dimensions, to understand the combination of all of those different things and to see where the trends are happening down at the granular level, that can sometimes be challenging. Uh, kind of a geeky slide here that's that's also fun uh, to think about what we're doing here is uh, how does a frog recognize food, right? So a frog isn't raised by its frog parents. It grows up in a pond and it somehow knows that when a cricket has a ape color movement, um, distance, things like that, it knows to eat it. And you can think of that as being similar to a machine learning algorithm, that you're looking for certain factors, whether it be size, duration, severity, time of year, those types of things that are telling you when to make a decision or based on that, can I predict something uh, based on what I know. Um, and that type of intuition took millions of years to evolve, uh, but business strategy evolves way too fast to keep up. Uh, so there'll be different scenarios with machine learning, but if you were in, say, an advertising scenario, well, the, the taste of the public changes probably every few weeks as to what they're going to respond best to. And so something like that, uh, you want to be able to programmatically, consistently update your algorithms. Um, and businesses don't have time for evolutionary learning of intuition. Uh, they're going to need revolutionary learning of machine learning. So the ability to programmatically 
and rapidly assimilate all of this information that they now have at their fingertips. Uh, this is a slide from Microsoft, and from the Microsoft perspective, uh, you can see in the quote there that uh, machine learning is delivering on one of the old dreams of Bill Gates, uh, computers that can see, hear, and understand, and that's where the Internet of Things is playing into it, that we have all of this data coming in from sensors. How do we make sense of it? How do we assimilate it? And how do we keep track of all of it? and uh, that the computer systems are becoming smarter with experience, that as you accumulate new and better data, you can retrain these algorithms, or as uh, the taste of customers changes over time, you can retrain it with new data. Uh, and historically, Microsoft has had just an extensive amount of experience with uh, machine learning. Uh, this isn't something which is brand new that they just decided to launch. Um, they've worked with machine learning on the Hotmail team, on the Bing team with uh, search engines. Uh, also, Connect is using uh, machine learning in order to detect motion and uh, translate that motion into something meaningful. Uh, Skype Translator is using machine learning, and the decision was made that, hey, let's reach out to all these different divisions and let's get some people under one roof so they can use so they can work together to provide a comprehensive product that can be used for uh, analytics and for other uses too. Uh, and why isn't machine learning all over the place right now? Because it has been around for, for decades. So first of all, right now it, it has been very expensive. Um, there were uh, extremely high costs for server setups to have everything done on site, specialized software, expensive licenses, and uh, big credit companies, uh, companies that are that have a lot of capital to spend, have been doing machine learning and do it internally. But uh, companies that uh, maybe aren't as specialized in areas that that have those large amounts of information or that are mid-sized or smaller sized have not had the opportunity to work with it. Uh, also, there's a lot of siloed data in organizations, and it makes it very hard to uh, assimilate everything for traditional machine learning applications. A lot of these uh, older machine learning tools were very specialized and did not work well with other BI tools and whatnot. Uh, also, there's a lot of complexity in order to put these things together. So there's always been a very, very steep uh, knowledge uh, a very steep level of knowledge required in order to get started. It used to be you had to know R, you had to know Python, you had to know, uh, you had to be, had taken some advanced statistics classes in order to even get started with machine learning. And those things are definitely still very, very helpful. And for someone to call themselves a true data scientist, uh, they're probably a requirement. But um, you can now get started and start learning data science with Azure ML without that whole intimidating learning process in order to get going. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can actually start building some simple models and getting value right away, which we'll show today. So moving on here to uh, where Azure ML fits into uh, this whole decision-making process. So you have your traditional data, whether it be data warehouse, cubes, Internet of Things, wherever it's coming from. Um, you have your reports, such as Excel, reporting services, Power BI, those types of things. And then uh, basically Azure ML is building into that tuition, the intuition part of the algorithm. And that's where you can build, train, test, tweak, and score models. And then you can also, uh, as I'll show in the demo, use a tool as simple as Excel to go verify the models that you've built in order to make sure that they're giving you the, the accuracy of answers that you're looking for. Uh, from a Microsoft perspective, the uh, modern data warehouse has, has really changed. So basically down at the bottom, you'll see we have data sources that are traditional, like OLTP, ERP, CRM. We now have non-relational data sources, which is uh, effectively the Internet of Things, and, um, and also big data. And then you can see up at the top, uh, it's very helpful to kind of think of the different types of BI and analytics um, offerings is self-service, so go spin up a table and uh, spin up a pivot table and power in uh, Excel or build some quick reports in Power BI. You have corporate, which is going to be data zen or reporting services and the ability to have scheduled and standardized reports. Uh, collaboration, so publishing to SharePoint and sharing what you've built or sharing it in Power BI. Uh, mobile. So using Power BI or Data Zen to view things on mobile devices and when you're on the move. And then also machine learning, which is taking the data and then 
being able to put it into action so you can use the trends that you've discovered to make decisions in real time. And there's a lot of different challenges from data volumes to uh, how do I integrate the cloud to how does everything fit together uh, that, that are going to play into this, uh, this new modern data warehouse. And just quickly, a high-level architecture example slide here. Uh, effectively, Azure ML is right now fully in the cloud. There's some new things coming for 2016, which you should keep an eye out for uh, regarding on-premise SQL Server. Um, but right now, you can get started right away with Azure ML in the cloud. And I think this kind of shows you that there's a couple different ways you can use it. So one way would be for traditional bulk predictions. So if you're looking to do traditional forecasting, say sales forecasting, you can upload a bulk, um, some bulk data, even straight from your SSIS packages, have some predictions made, and then pull it back into your source system, uh, or maybe pull it back into your CRM system in order to have some, some forecasts and predictions. Another way to use it, which I'll show in the demos, is to use it in real time where effectively you are taking new data that's happening, uh, and I use real-time sparingly, I know that's kind of a controversial term, um, but uh, people who are actually using it while they're in a com conversation with the customer, or while they're in front of a patient in a hospital, in order to get some predictions and recommendations as the data is entered. Uh, so the idea here would be you have a uh, salesperson go talk to a customer, and they say, what are what is your biggest challenge right now? Is it um, marketing, or is it uh, you know storage space, or is it inventory? And ask them a few other questions, and then you get a prediction. Hey, maybe this is the type of package that they might be interested in based upon the information that they gave you. Uh, some additional Microsoft success stories: uh, Carnegie Mellon has used uh, Azure ML. Uh, looking at weather data and, and things like that in order to optimize their heating and cooling systems. So this technology has already been used out there in the field and it has been put to work successfully. Also Pier 1 Imports is using it in order to uh, predict the products that customers will want. And I'll have a demo, demo that uh, is similar to that that kind of shows you how you can use historical behavioral data in order to predict success with future campaigns. And just to walk through some additional use case scenarios, if there's one thing I'd hope you get out of this presentation today, it's that uh, I think everybody in analytics should think a little bit differently now and that um, when you see a business problem, um, there's now some new ways that you might be able to solve it or to provide value to your organization. And, and so I, I call it thinking Azure ML. And, uh, Here's some examples of types, the types of uh, solutions you can provide. So looking at warranty and claims. So using past claim data, uh, use that to then predict future defect rates and trends. Uh, so basically forecasting defects and, and, uh, and claims. Looking at lean, so you can monitor uh, batches as they're uh, going through a manufacturing process and you can predict the likelihood that there's gonna be waste or scrap and then potentially uh, mitigate that situation. Uh, looking at machine component data, um, this is another success story uh, where the, uh, I believe it's the, the Krupp's uh, elevator company, um, I, I can't remember the exact name of the corporation for sure, is using Azure ML in order to proactively predict which elevators are going to need maintenance based upon the component data that they collect uh, from their elevators. And so that's preventing downtime and keeping customers happy. Healthcare, you could spend your entire career building machine learning models uh, in a healthcare environment. So looking at uh, patient visit, visit data, uh, you can predict uh, patients that are at high risk for readmission. Uh, Microsoft recently had a success story with a hospital out in, uh, it was either Oregon or Washington State, um, in which a hospital was able to predictly, correctly predict which patients would be readmitted uh, about 80 or 81 percent of the time, and that's extremely important uh, here in the U.S. When a patient is readmitted to the hospital within 30 days, the hospital receives less money from uh, Medicare uh, for that readmit visit. So by making sure that they do the job the right way in the first place, they get more money back from the government. So that's that's a very important uh, feature there in healthcare. You can also look at things, as I'll show in one of the demos, to look at uh, lab data, test data, biopsy data in order to predict risks. 
Uh, in marketing, you can do all kinds of things from creating target lists to analyzing what's going on with your Twitter feed, uh, logistics, uh, looking at the impact of weather on your ability to execute on-time delivery. So rather than having a customer get upset when a delivery truck doesn't show up, you can call them a few days ahead and say, due to the weather forecast, we're predicting that we can't uh, meet the on-time delivery promise that we made, um, and this is the reason why. And hopefully that uh, will keep them a uh, little bit more happy. And also in retail, from traditional market basket analysis to inventory predictions to stock out predictions, uh, the list is really endless of what you can do uh, with this technology. Uh, also from a high level, I'll go through the four types of machine learning algorithms that are very easy to do in Azure ML and that you can get started with right away. And if you start thinking about these four types of algorithms, um, I think you'll start finding some use cases in your own everyday scenarios. First is anomaly detection. So that's similar to the credit card company calling you and asking you, did this uh, purchase happen? And is it typical for you, basically by isolating a purchase that was not typical for your traditional behavior? Uh, clustering, so if you want to do an ABC analysis or rank your uh, customers on an opportunity scale of uh, 1 to 10 or something like that. Classification, so classification basically tells you yes or no and it gives you a prediction that some, or a probability that something will happen. And I'll show that in a demo. But that might say yes, this will happen and there's an 80% probability that it will happen. And then regression, which is for all practical purposes, forecasting. It takes past data and it projects it into the future. Um, so first, I'll move into a demo looking at heat stroke and weather. So this is taking data from two different sources. Uh, the first source is uh, HCUP SED data, which is government data uh, that we built a framework with a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's real uh, emergency room data from the state of, Ameri of Arizona from 2006, 2007, completely depersonalized and um, okayed for public use. You can go look it up and, uh, and get a hold of the data yourself if you want to. Um, it's visit level data and uh, we have ICD-9 codes, which is a diagnosis along with locations, uh, information about the, the visit. And uh, there's also demographic information such as age, gender, race, ethnicity uh, in the data. The second data set is uh, some data that we built into a model from NOAA. So we took the uh, daily historical weather data and put it into a, a star schema. And uh, effectively, that gives you by zip code, daily temperature, precipitation, snowfall, snow cover, those types of things. And, uh, and the question we want to ask is what factors are expected to impact heat stroke? And it, I picked this because it's pretty obvious, right? You're going to get heat stroke when it's hot outside. So there should be a, a strong correlation there that we can build a, a very accurate model with. Um, and then also, can you then forecast the number of heat stroke patients that, uh, that the, hospital in the, the hospitals in the cluster will see based upon a weather forecast? So when you know it's going to be 100 degrees next week, how many patients should you expect to come through the door and therefore what types of supplies and staffing should you have ready to go? So I will go ahead and move to the demo. So looking at that historical data of both weather and uh, patient visits in the state of Arizona, uh, we're here in Power BI and you can see here that uh, there were a total of 2,398 visits in the data sample set. And I isolated the data sample to uh, people who had heat-related illnesses. So anything that's uh, ICD code of 992 is basically something that's uh, related to heat that caused them to come to the ER. And looking over here in the upper right, you can see we have the maximum temperature as a line, and then we have ER visits as a bar. And you can see that for the years 2006 and 2007, that when the temperature gets up close to an average of 100 for the month, that's when the ER visits really shoot through the roof. So there's definitely a correlation there between the temperature outside and, uh, and how many heat stroke uh, patients are being admitted to the ER. Down in the bottom right, you can then see that uh, breaking it out by females and males and also by age group, that in younger patients, it's pretty evenly distributed 
whether it's a female or a male who's going who's going to be admitted with heat stroke. But as you get into the the middle aged groups, you can see that there's almost twice as many males uh, who are admitting to the ER as there are females. Um, and so there's also a, a different expectation as far as gender goes uh, by age. Um, then looking down here in the bottom left, if you look at how many visits by hospital, you can see for the whole data set that uh, Douglas Hospital had the, uh, the most ER visits. So if we were to filter for just that hospital, you can then see historically how many ER visits they had by ICD code, where you can maybe get a, a gauge of the severity of the problems they were having. Uh, and you can see that that same trend applies where as the temperature goes up, the number of people with heat stroke uh, also go up. And there's also that same gender uh, disparity going on in, the, in, in certain age groups. So knowing that, uh, how would you, using traditional business intelligence, forecast how many people are going to come to the hospital next week? I'm sure you could do it, but it, it'd be pretty tough, and it's not really what the tool is designed to do. And that's where you can use machine learning in order to build a nice, simple, uh, useful app to help you answer some of those questions. So just taking the factors that we talked about here, so just age, gender, maximum temperature, and the number of visits that were historically there in an individual month, so each row is, is one month uh, along with the age group and the gender, you can take this information and see some of the some of the months which are going to be summer have higher values also with higher temperatures and in a simple format like this which does not have a patient name or social security number or any type of identifying information this is all you need to then upload to Azure ML uh, in order to build out a model. And I'll show you here uh, in Azure ML, we have the model right here. It's one of my experiments. And when you have the, I just uploaded it for simplicity's sake as a CSV. Uh, you can also set up automated readers and writers. And if you were to do that, you can see you can bring in uh, you know, web URLs, a Hive query, SQL database in Azure, Azure table, blobs, pretty much any type of data, there's a way to, to get it in. And once we have that data in, you can visualize it, which is a nice feature. And you can see it's that data that we uploaded. And just from an analytics standpoint, I also brought in the year and month number, but that's not part of the model that was actually built. And then you can take a look, for example, at age group, what is the distribution of the data that you're uploading? Uh, if you're looking at gender, you know, a zero is male, one is female, you can see it's equally distributed between males and females. And so you can kind of make sure that there's some even distribution of the types of data that you brought up and, and things like that. And I won't get too technical here, um, but uh, effectively you can select pre-built algorithms uh, from the left-hand side here in Azure ML in order to test them out and see which ones work best. So in this case, we're basically using a boosted decision tree, uh, but if that didn't work well and you wanted to try something else, uh, there's some other options here too. So you could literally just delete the boosted decision tree, bring in a standard old-fashioned linear regression, and then rerun the model and see what kind of results you get. And basically those results then tell you in this case, we're splitting, we're doing a test. I won't go into detail on it, but we're basically taking data to build the model and then taking a little bit of additional data that was not used to build the model and to test it and see how good of a job it does at making predictions. And so it, it's pretty simple to get going here and learn how to use some different algorithms. If you're starting from scratch, down here in the bottom left where it says new, uh, there's a lot of pre-built examples from Microsoft that you can use in order to uh, in order to get going. So if you wanted to learn about um, regression, you can open up this pre-built experiment and see how they did it. I'm someone who prefers to have hands-on experience. I don't want to read a 300-page book and then go try it. And so it's very help. It was very helpful to to learn how to do some of these things by uh, by opening up these different existing experiments and uh, and working with them. So if we go back here. I'm going to uh, go back to Power BI, and in Power BI, I'm going to go to 
the output of that Azure ML model. So what I did is I built a model and then I took some additional data that was not used for the model and I looked at how good of a job the model did at predicting future heat strokes. So you can see here that uh, by age group we have predicted visits along with what were the actual visits and then what is the accuracy. So there's some that are a little uh, goofy here, but you can see there's a very small sample size where it predict four, predicted four and a half and there were only two. But when you get up to some of the larger numbers, it gets a little bit more accurate within you know five to 10%. Um, over here on the right, you can see by male and female that uh, it was not very accurate for females. There were only 43 visits and it predicted 66. Uh, but with males, it was a little closer within 10%. And then down at the bottom, when you start looking by age group, it actually gets uh, a lot closer in some of the some of the larger sample sizes. So overall, it was within two percent uh, error, but uh, or, or it was accurate within two percent. And once again, though, I purposely picked something that's blatantly obvious, which is heat-related illnesses, and compared it to heat in order to show how this works in the real world. I think the rule of thumb I've read is that if you can hit 80% accuracy, you're doing pretty good. And th this is real world, but this is a kind of an outlier and an exception where it works exceptionally well. So uh, basically once we know that, I'm going to go ahead and shut this down. How do you actually put that into practice? And that's where I have a uh, tool here. It's just right in Excel, so I'm going to uh, basically call an API from Excel. If I go back to Azure ML and I shut down this new button and I go to web services, you'll see that I published the algorithm that I built as a healthcare weather a sc scoring experiment. And this is a, a platform neutral API. So any tool that can call an API can basically call this model and get back a prediction. And you can either do a request response where you're sending one line of new data in order to get a unique prediction, or you can do a whole batch. So if you're doing an ETL package and you want to send through a thousand new customers and get predictions on which ones are uh, likely to be highly uh, targeted customers, something like that. Um, moving here to Excel, this is hooked up to the, to the, uh, the model sitting in the cloud. If we were to change the average max temperature from 90 to 105, uh, you'll see over on the right-hand side the far two columns, uh, Tmax, uh, the first column, oh, actually visits on the far right is the one you want to look at. You'll see it changed to 51. If we were to go back to 90, you'll see that it changes to 21 visits, and this is for males in age group number three in that whole cluster of hospitals. And if it were to go down to 60 degrees uh, for the average, you'll see they should only expect about one and a half visits. So it looks like it's pretty much in line with what we'd expect, and uh, this would be something you could even build into your uh, reports, maybe for the ER, of, hey, here's how many heat stroke patients you should expect next week or tomorrow or whatever the, the grain of the data might be. And that's how you can actually put it into action in order to, uh, to start creating business value. So I'll go ahead and head back to my slide deck. And demo number two is a, a marketing demo. The first data set is historical customer data of which customers bought products in a marketing campaign. And data set number two is a list of 18,000 potential customers that you haven't interacted before with before or within 10 miles of uh, a store location. Uh, there's some other stipulations here that are kind of real world challenges. So there's only $100,000 left in the sales and marketing budget and only uh, and there's a requirement to generate an additional $90,000 in net profit. So that's after the amount of money that you spend on the marketing campaign. And uh, the team is only able to go visit 2,000 customers in the time frame that's available. So they can't go to all 18,000 people on the list. So how do they choose? So I will go ahead and go back to Power BI. And so looking at this report, this is historical data in a traditional business intelligence type report here in Power BI. If we were to just look at uh, potential customers with the bachelor's degree who are, say, male and who are not homeowners, 
you'll see that uh, the charts change a little bit based on the values you've selected. Uh, it's kind of all over the place based on income. The yellow bars are people who did not buy in previous campaigns, and the green ones are ones who did. Uh, you can see that age is a factor, that the older they get, the, more, the less likely they are to buy, and that profession plays a part too. So uh, in the clerical profession, uh, younger folks are more likely to buy than our older folks, but income doesn't really play a part. Whereas with manual labor, which is looks like it's maybe here, yep, skilled manual, you can see that uh, uh, effectively there, there is a little bit of a difference based on income average. Um, also, by the type of profession, there's quite a bit of difference too. So if you were to then say, okay, how do I take that list of 18,000 people and cut it down to 2,000? Well, with traditional analytics, that's a little bit difficult to do because uh, there's all these different types of things that you can slice and dice by that interact together differently. So you could do it by sitting and, and slicing and dicing with a lot of different filters, but it's not really what those tools are designed to do. So once again, this is a machine learning uh, problem. Uh, we created a uh, machine learning model uh, in Azure, and uh, then I could pull up uh, kind of, I'll pull up an Excel sheet here actually to show you kind of what that model can can do. So if I go ahead and uh, move to that sheet quickly. I'll just wait for PowerView to open here in Excel. So then using that model, once we've verified that it works the way we want it to work, you'll see here, and, and this is a pretty ugly report, but uh, I'm trying to prove a point here as to, to how ML can be used to, to help a, a marketing campaign. If you had the sales team theoretically go out to all 18,000 people, which is not within the realm of possibility, there would be a cost of over a million dollars, and the net gain would be over $200,000. Uh, and only 47% of them approximately would be buyers. Uh, over here we have the people who were flagged by a machine learning model to be buyers, and if you went to all of the ones flagged to be buyers, only about 75% of them would really buy due to the accuracy of the model. Uh, the activity cost would be about half a million dollars, and the net gain would be $460,000. So just by using the flag target list, you're cutting your costs in half and doubling your profit. Now, if you also use this with some business intelligence filters, and let's just look at people with a bachelor's degree or within one mile of the location, then you'll see that the cost is under $100,000, so it's within budget, and there's a net gain of $97,000, which still meets the organization's goal. So by using machine learning with business intelligence, you can create a target list that's going to be within your budget, within your realm of possibility, and that still helps you uh, meet your goal. So I will, in the interest of time, move back to my slide deck. Uh, so by the numbers, you can see that if the sales team called on everybody, it wouldn't even be possible because it would be outside of budget. If you allowed them to randomly select people from the list of 18,000 people, 47% would be buyers, and the uh, uh, you would only have a net profit of $18,000, which does, doesn't help you make your sales goal. And if you isolated the likely buyers, 1,500 likely buyers, you would then have a net profit of uh, $97,000. So that's showing where combining these tools together can help you use your analytic uh, infrastructure in a, in a more effective way. So I will move to the next slide. So the third demo here is uh, using real data from the University of Wisconsin that is looking at breast cancer, potential breast cancer biopsies. So people who had uh, a biopsy done to see if they have breast cancer. And this data is available from the University of California, Irvine. So you can go replicate everything you're seeing here yourself uh, at home uh, after this presentation. And the question is basically, uh, are the cells benign or malignant, and can we predict that? So if I go ahead and uh, open up that demo,
So this is the data from University of California, Irvine. You can see that there's a biopsy ID number along with the diagnosis of malignant or benign. And then you get some other values, such as the radius of the cells, the texture, the perimeter, the area, the smoothness. Um, if we were to look at all of those, uh, there's quite a few. Let's just look at radius. And you can see the blue bars were not cancer, the orange bars were cancer. And you can see that as the radius goes up, the likelihood of cancer also goes up. Same thing for texture. As texture goes up, likelihood goes up. But what you, what you don't see here is a clear cutoff. So how do you come up with a red or green KPI of cancer or not cancer? You really can't. And that's where machine learning can be helpful. So uh, we all, I also built a uh, machine learning uh, model for, for this data. And I can show you what the data looks like. So the, the ML upload was just looking at radius, texture, perimeter, area, smoothness, compactness, all of these different things that play together in order to give you a one for malignant or zero for benign. And if we were to then test that model, which I have down here as detail summary, and I'll make sure that all of these are visible. You'll then see that the model was able to predict cancer and not cancer about 93% of the time. And what's nice here, too, is you can look at, uh, from a signal detection perspective, so a true negative means you predicted something wouldn't happen and it didn't happen. True positive means you predicted it would and it did. False negative means you predicted something would not happen and it did happen. And false positive means you predicted cancer and it was not cancer. So false negative is really the worst case scenario. You tell somebody it's not cancer and it actually was. And you can go ahead and, uh, and open up that list and get the ID number. And then you can start exploring, based on that information, uh, 85636. Based on that unique, uh, oh, I think it was up here near the top, 845636, there it is. You can start looking at the values and see where you went wrong. And in the interest of time, I won't do that right now. But what this allows you to do is see where did the model miss big time, and how can I figure out how to tweak my model or use a different algorithm or bring in some new data to make the model better. Um, and then once you have a model that, that you're happy with and that works at a level that you consider to be uh, acceptable, you can then, as, as we showed with the other example, you can then put it into action uh, in, uh, in real scenarios. So if a pathologist is looking at the values, they're going to intuitively know, based upon those values, whether something is cancer or not. But what you can do with this app is give them uh, a little uh, indicator in the upper right-hand side of the screen. So say if the texture, instead of being, well, first I'll go over on the right here. So a 1 means a prediction of cancer. And here's the probability that it is cancer. If the texture, instead of 28, were 50, uh, you'll then see that uh, the probability goes up to 91%, but if instead it were 20, then the prediction goes down to zero, but there's still a 43% chance that it is cancer. So this might be a little helper app that could help in a scenario like that where they don't have to wait for the data to go to, to the data warehouse, through the ETL, and back into a cube before they can make use of it. They can use it uh, in their everyday activities. So I'll go ahead and move to the slide and, and close things out. Uh, so one other thing to note here is you don't need big data in order to make machine learning work. That uh, diagnostic uh, cancer app, uh, the machine learning model for that was built with only 569 rows of data. Uh, and you still got a 93% accuracy rate. Um, additionally, um, you can uh, basically make the model even better if you get more and better data and make sure that you're accounting for outliers and uneven distributions of different samples and, and things like that. So how does Azure ML bring machine learning to the masses? The first, as we talked about, is price. Uh, you can go home and sign up for a trial account for free and you get uh, a bucket of dollars that you can use which will be sufficient for learning the tool uh, tonight if you want to. Also programming languages, you can use R and Python and Azure ML if you're an advanced user, but if you're a beginner, you can get going without having to write those languages. So you can start understanding how it works, looking at examples, and actually building some models that do not use those languages. The demos we showed today do not use R and Python. 
Uh, also, with the infrastructure, it's 100% in the cloud, so you don't have to buy any servers, you don't have to buy any licenses, you don't have to do any maintenance or upgrades. And also, there's a platform-neutral API to call the model. So there's, uh, it's very, effectively, if you know how to call an API from the tool you're using, you, you can send data to and from Azure ML. Uh, from a traditional versus new way of looking at uh, machine learning, um, basically Azure ML allows areas of business that traditionally, business and analytics that traditionally didn't get to do predictive analytics to now start bringing this into their, their toolkit. I should note also that there's an Azure ML marketplace. It's included in the slide deck here. So you can actually effectively rent or buy a model from someone else that's already built. And if I go ahead and click on that link, you'll see that there's all kinds of pre-built models that you can start using with your data. So something like frequently bought together. So people who bought this also bought this. Well, there's an existing model out there for it. And you just need to upload your data and then start using the API and, uh, and you can make, make sense of it. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'd like, I'd, my hope would be is that everybody views issues differently. Uh, just add Azure ML and you can potentially start solving things in new ways. So a Salesforce that traditionally just got a dashboard of how they're doing can get, now get a list that tells them these are the people you need to see to try to meet your goal. Um, recently I was at a car dealer looking to trade my car in and he went to Kelly Blue Book to look up the value and then he brought out this huge ream of paper to look at how long all the Nissan sat on his lot tying up his dollars in inventory. But with Azure ML you can give him a prediction of what he should pay and how long that vehicle is going to sit on the lot. In a restaurant, you can have real-time sales. So based on the temperature, inventory, what's about to expire, those types of things, what do you want to have on sale to drive business? And you can also do a lot with uh, marketing and, uh, and digital marketing. So I'll go ahead and, uh, in the interest of time, move to Q&A. As I mentioned before, if anybody has to get going, please uh, send me a message on Twitter or LinkedIn, and I'd be more than happy to network and share ideas and, uh, and basically uh, do what I can to try to help you out. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Greg. That was outstanding. Thanks for all those insights and the presentation. That was great. Um, we do have some questions here. If uh, anyone else uh, does have questions, please post them in the GoToWebinar tool there, um, and we can ask away here. So uh, first up here, um, we have a question about, um, so how does a beginner get started with all this? I mean, it seems pretty intense. There's a lot going on here. Um, where would one get started uh, for resources as far as machine learning and maybe using Azure ML? Sure. So, so first of all, for, from the machine learning standpoint, the good thing is, is it's been around for decades, so there's a ton of documentation out there on it. Uh, specifically, my thought would be is go straight to Azure and uh, sign up for a free trial and, and get right into uh, Azure ML. And, uh, and basically start looking at some of those pre-built models that are provided uh, by Microsoft uh, when you go down to the new button in the lower left. And there you can take a look at what type of data they're bringing in, what are they doing at each step of the process, and what is it effectively accomplishing. And uh, that would be my recommended way of doing it, but because it's, a, it's an established discipline uh, from a non-Microsoft perspective, there's a ton of data, a ton of examples, and uh, a lot of books and things out there too. So um, for my, my thought is, is what's nice about Azure ML is you can get that hands-on experience now that uh, before you had to know R or something like that in order to start getting some hands-on experience. Does that answer the question? Yes, that was great. Um, someone had a question here. Uh, they're wondering if you could possibly, if you still have it up, could you show the machine learning model for the hospital cancer demo? Sure. They were just curious about how you connected the measures into training it. Yep. And then maybe while you're looking for this, um, someone was interested about the cost for using this. Is it based on transaction or some other factor? Uh, yeah, so I can talk to that too. Uh, that was a slide I might have glazed over. So first of all, looking at the model, uh, it's actually a very simple model. Uh, there are some white papers and things out there about that data set because it's been around for a while. If you go to the University of California Irvine's website, there's a lot of links and documentation 
about the best way to use that data. I just kept it simple here, uh, and I still got over 90% accuracy, even though I, I think some of the other papers out there are getting higher uh, accuracy rates. But all we did is, is I basically brought in the data that I showed you. So if we visualize that, you'll see that it brought in like uh, diagnosis, radius, texture, perimeter. You can look at those different data points here and I'll look at them on a histogram. Um, then bringing it into the columns. So basically it tells you which columns you want to use. And so I'm excluding uh, the diagnosis uh, because we already have a, a model built along with the ID number and the result. And then you take the algorithm and you score the algorithm um, and basically get an output that gives you a prediction of yes or no along with the probability. Uh, there's some examples out there about this also, but it, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, there's no custom code here. There's not a lot going on. And uh, if you want to try a different algorithm, this is a classification model, which uh, I showed you of the four models. So those four models I talked about when I had the slide are right here. Anomaly, classification, clustering, and regression. And a classification gives you that yes, no answer. So if instead of a, uh, a prediction of um, a forecast value, if you just want a yes, no, uh, we could try a different algorithm here from classification, so maybe a two-class decision jungle. Then you can pull, if you know what type of uh, settings you want to have on that decision jungle, there's some options here, uh, and then you can bring that down and then you rerun the model and see how good of a job it did with predictions. Uh, also, if somebody on the line is an R programmer, you can do everything in custom R, so you don't have to use any of the pre-built algorithms. And how, and uh, how do you know which algorithm to choose? There's like a whole list of them there, like when you expanded that. How do you know which one to pick from, or is it just an educated guess? So it's a little bit of both. There's a lot of documentation over which algorithms are best for which type of business problem. But with this tool, is you can do things so quickly that I could test every one of those pre-built algorithms in about an hour and then just see which one worked the best. So you can, you can use uh, some research and, and, and your education and things like that in order to decide which one you think is best, but this tool does such a good job of, of running through things that uh, effectively you can just by brute force figure out which one works best without fully understanding what it's doing in the background. Sure. Okay. Makes sense. And then did you have that slide on the pricing? Yes. So that one is here, and it was hidden for some reason by accident. But basically that slide is here in the deck, and if I go ahead and click on it, it's two things. So you're looking at total utilization um, of processing power. So there's the free account, and then there's also a standard account, which requires an Azure subscription. Uh, and you have all your specifications here. And then if, from a pricing standpoint, if you're using the free version, uh, you do get a bucket of dollars per month. I'm not sure what it's at right now that you can use. Uh, but you're basically looking at about a dollar per uh, studio hour. So that's while the machine learning algorithms are processing or training. And then also when you're using the API, it's about $2 for every hour of processing that goes on as you're calling the API. And as I showed, those calls happen um, pretty quickly. And also per transaction, there's a fee of 50 cents for every 1,000 transactions. So when you're testing this tool, uh, you can train a model usually in less than a minute. Uh, so you can do a lot of work with, I, I think it's $150 a month you get for free in your account to, to get going with this tool. But you'll have to verify that. It might have changed since the last time I looked. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like uh, we're running out of time here. Um, I appreciate uh, your time today, Greg. Uh, it was very, very helpful. Thank you for presenting to the community here. Um, do you have any uh, last Last words of wisdom, parting advice? Uh, just to, to thank everybody for uh, allowing me this opportunity today. And uh, if there's any additional questions, please reach out to me. I'll be glad to help out. Great. Outstanding. And uh, just a note for everyone that attended today, thank you so much. Um, just to let you know that when you do sign off, uh, there will be a brief survey. If you could please fill that out, that would be very helpful for us. And uh, thanks again, everyone. Uh, 
appreciate you spending the time today to uh, take in this great content, uh, Rise of the Machine Learning. Uh, have a great day. Thanks again. Thanks again, Greg. Thank you.